Okay, we have our full complement of uh, panelists, so let's, uh, let's get underway uh, without further ado. Uh, my name is Richard Downey. I'm Deputy Director uh, with the Africa Program here. Welcome uh, to the second panel on uh, the Nigerian uh, security situation around the elections. Uh, the focus of, of this second panel is, is really to hear from some of the prominent civil society leaders uh, in Nigeria who we've invited uh, over to Washington and to hear about uh, some of the grassroots, uh, grassroots efforts underway to prevent uh, or militate against electoral violence during the run-up to uh, the polls, during the polling itself, and, and also in the very high-risk period in the immediate aftermath uh, of polling. Uh, so we're going to hear some uh, analysis from our guests uh, about specific flashpoint regions of the country, uh, also have them flag some of the risk factors around the planning and execution of the elections. Uh, and we also want to hear how they view the roles and responsibilities uh, of some of the other key uh, actors who have a role in providing peaceful, secure environment for these elections, uh, including the, the federal government, state and local governments, uh, the security uh, forces of, of the state, political parties, uh, ca their candidates, and, and the media. And we, uh, several of our panelists uh, spoke to those points as well. We have a great set of panelists. Uh, you have their bios, so I won't go through them, but uh, just suffice to say, we'll start uh, this morning with uh, Chinedo Nwagu, uh, Abuja-based program manager of the Clean Foundation, uh, an NGO working to promote public safety, security, and accessible uh, justice. Uh, Chon Bagu uh, will go next. He's a Nigeria country director of Search for Common Ground, uh, working to end conflict and build sustainable peace in Nigeria. Uh, Awal Ibrahim Musa, uh, aka Rafsanjani, uh, as you'll see from his bio, wears uh, many, many hats, uh, but for the purposes of this morning, he's Executive Director of the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, SISLAC, uh, working to strengthen links between African civil society and legislatures. Uh, and finally, uh, on my immediate right, we'll hear from Inemo Samiana, uh, Samiyama, who's uh, Country Director of Stakehold Demo Stakeholder Democracy Network. Uh, which is an international NGO working on uh, governance, in environmental, uh, and security dynamics in the Niger Delta. Uh, I've asked all of our guests to speak just for 10 minutes or so. Uh, our time is compressed somewhat, and we want to allow plenty of time for uh, interaction with the audience. So uh, let's start with uh, Chinedo. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much. I uh, want to say a big thank you to the organizers, and then uh, morning or is it afternoon? It's, it's almost five o'clock in Nigeria now. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, friends, colleagues. Um, there's a saying in my place, uh, the Igbo people of the Southeast Nigeria, that Okamakache Eujini before Chieji. And I'll translate. It means it's better to look for the black goat in the afternoon or when it's still daytime before night comes and then it disappears with the times. And I think that's where we are in Nigeria now. The 2015 elections is just seven months away, and we have an opportunity to find the black goat while it is still daytime. Um, it's, it's, for me, it's a great year with a great opportunity. And I would want to, uh, we've heard the first panel talk about the security challenges. And for us, the idea basically is to put on the table some ideas we think might um, serve as um, mitigating factors to deal with some of the threats that have been identified. Um, I've tried to structure some of these things for what the federal government would do, what INEC should do, what the National Assembly and state governments, uh, international community and civil society, um, and I'll try and stick to that. I think I should start with, uh, well, a bit of the overflowed issue of the insurgency, and I would not believe it too much. Um, like it's been said in the first panel, it is a national threat. We, those of us that live in Abuja, you know, have had the experience of sending messages to those in Midugri about the fortnight and saying, sorry, we heard there were fresh attacks. I hope you and your family are safe. And then two weeks after, the same people are sending messages to you. Uh, sorry, we heard there were attacks in Abuja. I hope yourself and your family are safe. So it, it's not just limited to a particular section of people. The threat affects every single one of us, and it's something we should deal with uh, going into 2015. Uh, for those of us that are from southern Nigeria that are still, you know, perhaps consoling ourselves that it's, oh, it's another problem, it's not. We've had of arrests in Abia State. We've had of, uh, well, failed bomb attempt in Oweri. 
you know, and then Lagos, there's been a buzz or two. Uh, in fact, there's a recent video claiming that, you know, the Lagos incident was related to it. So the, the, the problem is spreading, and we had a chance to contain it a few years ago. We didn't. We still have a chance to contain it now before we go into the 2015 elections. And um, like, like, like Jibo said, said earlier, um, the, the challenge is that for 2015 election, the security conditions are quite exceptional, like he mentioned. And so it's, it's not like the 20, 2011 elections. And, and for 2011 elections, we got it right, uh, but we didn't actually. We, we made improvements uh, on our previous uh, elections. It was better than 2007, 2003, and definitely 1999. Uh, but for 2015, we can't just afford to get it right, uh, to just make improvements. We should get it right, uh, because the times are peculiar, and the demands for these elections are quite different from everything we've had uh, before. And one of the ways we could start perhaps taking steps forward would be to prosecute electoral offenders. Um, as long as impunity continues to thrive, as long as there are no consequences for misconduct, people would continue to do all manner of things and get away with it. And yes, INEC has you know, said it's prosecuting a few people, but the question is, who are these people? The old woman in the village who perhaps registered twice, her son-in-law, you know, who did the same thing. We need them to fry the big fish. And that's the best way of sending a message across to all that are involved that were serious about not condoning such things in our polity. Uh, I think also part of what we ha has been thrown up by the insurgency is the fact that um, the number of internally displaced persons in Nigeria is quite alarming. And if something, if it continues at this rate, we would overwhelm Cameroon, Niger, Chad, and if it moves down south, Bene. Ghana and the rest of them might also go. Uh, UNODC, um, no, sorry, UN Office for Humanitarian and Coordinating, uh, UN Office uh, Coordinating Humanitarian Affairs recently released a report that put the figures at 15.5 million of persons affected by the uh, crisis in northern Nigeria. Uh, those, the people in, in, in the internally displaced persons are about 650,000. Now that's, that's, that's significant. How we manage that going into the 2015 elections also would impact on the elect elections, because whether you like it or not, uh, if we don't take care of their welfare, they will feel disconnected from the society, and if they feel disconnected from the society, they provide a ready ground for recruitment. You know, so we must be able to bridge that gap and stop that from happening. Um, also, something that was mentioned earlier, I, I think it's the proliferation of small arms. We, we have arms everywhere. It's just everywhere. It's in the hands of people sh who shouldn't have it. Uh, having this conversation in America is quite interesting. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, but I think, I think it's something we should deal with, and I'll put it in context for you. Yes, like was said in the first panel, after the Kitty election, there was no incident, good and well. Same could be said about a do and on do elections. But we were in those states after the elections. The mornings where the results were announced, people shot in the air in celebration. And the question is, those arms were in the states the day before. What if the elections had gone the other way? What would those same guns that were being shot in jubilation be used for? And, and, and so we should take that into consideration going to 2015 if we don't mop up the small arms in the states and perhaps tighten our borders a little bit, we would have uh, problems in our hands. Going, moving on to uh, perhaps INEC, Ekiti State, the Ekiti issue has come up severely. And yes, we applaud them for Ekiti. They got a few things right in Ekiti, not just because there was 20,000 police officers, uh, not because the agencies coordinated themselves. All of that played an important part. But I think most importantly is INEC was able to get its act together somewhat. And I would give an example. In, in Undo election, we were there also. Um, the state capital, Akure, by two o'clock in some polling units, materials had not arrived. And if it's a place where the opposition or a, a, a place where a place that's a stronghold for a particular candidate, the impression people get is they have refused to give us materials so they, they could undermine the elections here. And when you have that happening in different locations, it, it, it creates potential for conflict. But that didn't happen in Ekiti. So materials arrived on time. The INEC staff, they were trained properly. So you didn't have all the logistic challenges we had had in eight previous elections before Ekiti. Ekiti is the ninth staggered election we've had since uh, 2011. Oshun, which is happening next month, August 9th, will be the 10th. So we've had several rehearsals. They seem to have 
corrected it in Ekiti. We're hoping they would correct, get it right again in, in Oshun, not just so we can pat ourselves on the back, but because it sends a message to the populace that yes, we can manage the 2015 elections. And th that small dose of confidence is imperative for dousing whatever tensions or whatever apprehensions people have going into the 2015 elections. Um, National Assembly, I will just drop this, and I'm sure Rav Sanjani will touch on it. The Electoral Act still needs to be tidied up before the elections. And also, we, we need to see increased supervision of security spending for elections, but let me not overflow those issues. Moving down to the states, something interesting we found out is while historically in Nigeria, conflict is usually centered around presidential uh, and, and perhaps gubernatorial elections, but that seems to be changing for 2015. I'm not saying the tension wouldn't be there for the presidential, certainly it's, it's still there, but for 2015 election, a lot of tension from our own findings also going around the states. Uh, where governors have served out two terms and are due for retirement, or well, they're due to leave office. And it seems that their retirement plan is to move to the Senate. So the governor is leaving the state house and wants to move to the Senate. And that means he has to unseat a seven senator without necessarily giving the person the key to the government house. And so this is playing out in several states, Akwaibom, you know, uh, Abia State, and all the rest of them. Now, while that on the surface doesn't look like, oh, it's not a big deal, the governor can do that. It, when you go further down, what you find out is within the, every state, there are three, sen three senatorial districts. Now, we've had 1999 to 2007, you know, in Nigeria, somehow we count, uh, we believe some, some, everybody should be in office for eight years. So they count 1999 to 2007 and in 2007 to 2015. So in most states, each of the, each senatorial district has had a chance of producing a governor. So for example, uh, in Abia State, uh, the center, I'm just giving an example. So Abia Senatorial District, Abia um, Central, District, Central District has produced a governor. The Southern Senatorial District has produced a governor. And now the Northern Central District is saying it's our turn. So where you, when you take this tension and add that of the governor wanting to retire to the Senate without necessarily moving the Senate or to the government house, and it becomes a clash, then you have a particularly volatile issue on your hand. And that, we're seeing that play out in several states, not just one or two. You know, and I think some, it's something we should look at managing properly uh, uh, and, uh, within the states. Also, inter and intra-party politics. We heard in the first session that for the first time, um, we are having a major opposition. So the competition is stiff both at the federal level and at the state level, and, and we are seeing defections and counter defections within the, uh, the states. A, a, a those state House of Assembly is, on, is having a crisis now because of such issues. So unless we're able to deal with that at the state level, it becomes a problem. My time is almost up. There's also the issue of vigilante groups. A lot of states, Nigeria has not formally adopted state policing, but a lot of states are just recruiting vigilante groups. They are untrained, they are armed, there are no guidelines governing their conduct, and unless we're able to deal with that and create a regulatory framework for them, we would possibly have states that have armed militia going into 2015 elections. Um, trying to tidy things up, I will just touch on two things. First is, the opportunities are still there. Uh, if we are going to prosecute uh, uh, electoral offenders and also deal with a lot of security challenges we're having, we must deal with electoral justice, which means our courts must be functioning. And then we must continue to invest in security and justice sector reforms. Unfortunately, given the big scenario we have in Nigeria and the problems, we don't see commensurate funding or attention going in those directions. And so it's a bit of an irony that yes, we recognize that the injustice issues are there, the justice crisis is there, the security crisis is there, but then the justice sector, uh, security sector reforms are well, somebody else deal with those ones. Um, now, lastly, civil society engagement. It's important we continue to have conversations like this. Uh, my organization, for example, uh, does an election, pre-election security threat analysis, basically looking at across the states and looking at what are the issues and bringing these things to public light so that we can have conversations about them going forward. 
And, and I think it's a kind of conversation we need to have going forward until 2015 elections because it helps in creating civic awareness and letting people know what the real issues are because a lot of things get swept under the carpet uh, when with all the drama happening in the country. So it's important we continue to have that civic engagement and have civil society engage both the security uh, agencies and the government. I would want to sum up by saying, uh, using a saying once more from my place that, uh, and I think Chino Achebe in his, in his uh, last book, um, There Was a Country, quoted it, that unless we know where the rain started beating us, it would be very difficult to realize when we get dry. I think pretty much Nigeria knows where the rain started, and I'm hoping we'll be dry soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chinedu. Um, can I return next to uh, Chom, please, for his remarks? Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just make some comments about the context. I think Jibo identified about three. Uh, th security threat to Nigeria, which is a uh, banditry in the northwest, Boko Haram in the northeast, and intercommunal violence in north central. There is a fourth and a fifth one. I think that uh, there is the whole issue of Fulani in Nigeria. Uh, most of the attacks in the north central area and part of the north are uh, usually said to be done by headsmen. And this idea is that these headsmen have become a target. And I'm saying that the Fulani are in the whole of West Africa and part of Central Africa. And they, 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 they are massively deployed in Nigeria. And something very serious happened in the first week of April. The federal government sent troops to attack Fulani settlements in four states. In Plateau State, in Kaduna, Southern Kaduna State, Southern Kaduna, in Nasara State, and in Benue State. Now, no justification. We will just assume that they are supposed to be the people attacking communities. No process, no legal or any other process was undertaken to identify this. And we found that soldiers just went to communities and were asking, are you full and if you are full and if they kill you. And this is the government. And I'm saying that Boko Haram will be a child's play if the present threat faced by Fulani is pushed further, in the sense that the Fulani are suffering from cattle theft, they are suffering from intercommunal attacks, and now more and more they are losing their cattle and therefore are being left in a situation of desperation to defend their way of life. And I'm saying that if something is not done very urgently, what this will mean is that the new Boko Haram is being created, which will have to fight across mid central and northern Nigeria for their life. I think that this is very important. The second one, of course, is the issue of the Niger Delta. I'll leave most of it to Mr. Semiyama because uh, he will do more justice to it. But because of uh, the, the fact that there is likely to be an end to the amnesty program in the Niger Delta. And now, with 2015, we see an increasing emergence of uh, call groups. These call groups are arming, and they are sponsored by politicians. I suspect that the situation we are facing may be like 2003, when these uh, militants uh, became really, were supported by politicians to become a major threat to Nigerian security. I think it is important to keep that in the public view, because otherwise we will be taken by surprise. The second point I think is, I don't accept the claim that Nigeria will never collapse. I think that we are, we are giving much to faith. I think that from what is happening, we've never had a situation as bad as we have today. Because when you go to rural Nigeria, they have simply do not believe 
that the government exists or it has anything to do with them. Most people in the Northeast, in central Nigeria, and most of the North, as I know it, and even in the Niger Delta, don't feel the presence of government. We cannot say that we are safe when, for the past three months, Boko Haram has just been killing people on a daily basis, and there is no response. There is simply no response as far as the people in the Northeast, in Southern Borno, and Northern parts of Adamawa, do, they do not see the security forces. They have not felt their impact. And the issue is, who are these guys who are bombing other cities in Nigeria? Are they Boko Haram or something else? We just assume that they are Boko Haram. And yet we know that Boko Haram has been cornered on the corridor to the, to, to, to the Cameroonian mountains. So who are these guys who are exploding these IEDs? I have not had any credible analysis to show me who they are and what are their motivations. When we just say they are Boko Haram, it can mean anything. Is it the uh, urban cells of Boko Haram that are doing this or who? And therefore, we still are waiting for something to happen because we don't even understand why they are bombing particular places and who is behind them. And I think that that is important because how do we know that it could not be used against the elections? Now, as such for common ground, we've been engaged in both the Niger Delta, we were engaged with the amnesty program from the beginning. Then we moved in to work from what we call uh, reintegration of uh, ex-militants from the community point of view. And this was to build capacity at the community level to be, to, to be able to receive ex-militants on their own terms. Because the government's approach was simply uh, a paying system to ex-militants, which was becoming very resentful for, for, for members of communities who thought that some of these guys, why should they be paid when they have done a lot of damage to their communities? And that program has been very well implemented and received by the communities because the communities are beginning to acquire some level of uh, power to manage their own space. Now for the elections, we have a second phase of that program, and we are covering four states in the Niger Delta. The, I think the importance of that is that we don't think that the, what is happening at the top, where politicians, government security people are busy discussing issues that they, they, that they do nothing about, that what will save Nigeria and save these elections if communities are able to manage their space effectively in a way that they can prevent abuses of the electoral process and reduce the violence. We've created democracy spaces at this community where they discuss issues. We've created a media system in this community where they can discuss and share information. And we hope that we will use it during the elections to strengthen these community structures to be able to respond to be able to repel violence, to be able to refuse abuses. I think that this is, this is very, very important for us, particularly in the Niger Delta, because the Niger Delta has had a history of violence, of abuses of the electoral process. And if we can reduce that, we think that the uh, election will become more credible. In the North Central, in the North Central uh, Nigeria, we've also been working on that. Because there have been violence in Plateau State for 14 years, which means that communities are beginning to get used to violence. And therefore, we will not be surprised if the elections are characterized by violence. And we're saying that people should not give up because it is critical to have some changes which will give people some hope. And so we are implementing what we call a, both a security and a peace architecture, both at the state level and at the local level, where we're integrating both security and traditional security systems, which means that we're bringing the military, the police, to work with communities to identify uh, early warning system, to identify mechanism to respond to violence and to respond to, to, to insecurity. In the Northeast, we've just uh, opened an office 
And we're starting uh, to do an assessment of the impact of the violence on livelihoods, on groups, on families. And we're looking at, this is a great opportunity. We've been working before in the Northeast looking at uh, security violence or reducing uh, human rights abuses by security forces. We think that we've got quite some support and cooperation by the security forces, and we're taking it to the community level to make sure that uh, there is some level of understanding between the security forces and communities, and that communities know where to report incidences of human rights. Uh, now we are, we are moving into the Northeast proper, which is uh, Meduguri, and we are trying to cover the state, of, uh, the state where there is emergency. And our hope is that is to really, first and foremost, to give voice to communities, because so far, the only voices you hear are voices of government and that of Boko Haram. And we think that that is not good enough. The people, particularly after the Chibo girls, we've seen some steering by communities trying to express their views about the situation and try to organize. The Nigerian security force cannot cover the whole country, cannot provide security all over Nigeria as presently, which means there is need to give some role to communities themselves. And uh, because uh, what the state has uh, concentrated is to create uh, physical security, roadblocks. Roadblocks have been totally useless. They have not provided any security to anybody, apart from violating the dignity and the, uh, the, the, the self-respect of people. And we're saying that why can't we provide, support communities to create a security system that they have a role to play? Because we believe that that will give them additional psychological uh, a sense of safety if they have a hand in securing the environment. I think that that is critical. And to conclude, let me say that to secure the elections, one, INEC must become consistent. We've known the INEC chairman, and we know what he does. Some of the successes in Nechitanko were they deliberate or by accident. Why did he decide that there will be no election in the Northeast in the first place? What was the analysis? How did he come back by that? Now he has changed, which means integrity is at stake. The chairman is not being consistent. We want to know why did he take that decision? And I think that to secure the election is INEC must be seen to be a partner to the citizens to secure and make sure that the elections are free and fair. Unless that consistency is maintained, people are going to assume that he will allow the PDP to steal the elections. It's very, very important. The second issue is there have always been the tendency when the elections are coming, people say, hey, there will be insecurity, people will be attacked, there will be violence. And therefore use it as an excuse to militarize the elections. And militarizing the elections means you provide an opportunity for the military and police forces to participate in stealing the vote. Or undermining the opposition from its activities. We must be careful in encouraging that you know there is violence, therefore militarize the whole place. Bring out tanks. I don't see. The problem of the Nigerian election is no more about snatching ballot boxes. It's about changing the figures. And as a civil society person, when I am observing the election, I want to have access to the collation center, the military and police will block me. And they will change the figures there and manipulate the system. This is, what, now, this is what we should be dealing with. It is not about uh, snatching ballot boxes. It has gone beyond that. Now, uh, the other third issue is the whole issue that a lot of people have been displaced, both in the Northeast and North Central Nigeria. Will they vote? Where will they vote? INEC is here to give us an answer to that. These people want to participate in the election, but they are not where they registered for the elections. So what is going to happen to them? We've seen the role of IDPs in the violence in Plateau State. People who left Plateau State 
to Bauchi are the main people who come to attack because they have a grievance. And I'm saying that if you have a lot of IDPs who are not able to vote, what, how do we guarantee that they will uh, stay peaceful? How do we guarantee that they will accept what is happening? And then the last issue, let me just say that uh, a lot of arms are entering Nigeria. Nobody has talked about it. These arms are not coming for hunting. <laughs> they are not going to use it to just hunt bats and, and bush meat. These guns are going to be used against other Nigerians for the sake of the elections. And we have to do something to make sure that these arms are not used. And how do you make sure? We've always blamed the youth. The youth are not in the politics because the age, the age uh, barrier has made sure that youth cannot even get into the politics properly. So what do you want them to do? They have no jobs, they have no future, they have no hope. And yet we blame them that they are the ones who are doing the bidding of the politicians. So instead of blaming the youth, we should look for those who are responsible for what the youth are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chom. Let's uh, turn uh, now to uh, Afsajani. Thanks. Thank you. Let me join others to also thank the organizers. You know, uh, even though my coming was like a, a crash one, you know, because uh, I was not originally supposed to be here. You know, somebody was supposed to be here, and uh, for some logistic and visa issue, he was not able to make it. And I was in the U.S. for other things. You know, we just launched a report on uh, betting, on peacekeeping, you know, operation, the role of uh, the military and army in terms of uh, human rights abuses, you know, while in the peacekeeping. So I got to know about the program, and I was. Uh, contacted to also be part of this uh, program. Anyway, I thank you for inviting me. Well, in addition to what has been said, General Chombago, as we call him, has uh, already you know, uh, provided the space for me. So what I would do is just to add a little. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are many you know, threats that we are actually facing. One of the threats that I think you know, we should be thinking about or we should be worried about is also the absence of electoral framework that will guarantee people's you know, vote. As we are today now, we did not even have the Electoral Act amend amendment passed by the National Assembly. You have how many months the election? So with what are you going to even do the election? The National Assembly has not done the amendment. And even after they do that, we know how the previous election happens, you know, money was not even provided by the National Assembly. We have to, you know, and CISLA in particular had to address a series of press conferences, you know, urging the National Assembly and the government to provide resources for INEC to conduct, you know, election. So you have a situation where if the citizen did not have electoral framework that they can believe in, that they can actually trust on, that can also lead to threat to, you know, um, violence you know, in Nigeria. So I think we should also be concerned with that. The second you know, threat that I think is very, very important is the artificial poverty and disempowerment you know, by the politicians on the youths. A lot of Nigerian youths, whether in the north, whether where there is Boko Haram, where there is uh, you know, um, no Boko Haram, you have army of youth that are completely unemployed that are just waiting for anybody to give them as small as maybe two dollars to kill. If you give them and you say, this is what I want, they are going to do that. And nobody is doing anything to you know, engage them in a positive way. Politicians and some of the reckless government officials, they are ready to hire them, to give them you know, substance that can make them intoxicated and then they go and do all sorts of things. We have them uh, plenty, and nobody is actually doing anything, even within the political parties that are supposed to do voter education. ANEC and political parties are not engaging on the electorate 
to educate them even on the, you know, um, on the election and also the need to have peaceful you know, election. For me, that is also um, a big problem. Another area which I think you know, it is also a threat to the 2015 is the absence of level playing fields or rather imposition from the political parties across. You, know, you have you know, this good fatherism that is very, very strong. It's still happening and it will happen. Already some parties have determined who is going to be the governor, who is going to be the House of Rep, who is going to be the senator. That is also a, you know, a serious problem. It's all leading to the bigger you know, um, trouble. Um, I will not touch on those other areas that people have talked about. Another area which I think is also a serious problem is militarization of the election. The whole Nigerian security forces put together police, army, custom, and all of them. There are no more than 1.5. And you, you, have, you have over at least 160 million Nigerians. So in response to the Honorable Commissioner that he said that it is the large number of the security that will guarantee maybe you know, um, non-balance of election, I wonder if you have you know, put together all the security forces, custom, police, army, immigration, all of them, they are not more than 1,500,000 and you have 160 million, how are you going to apply that? I don't think that is going to be you know, um, a solution. So over relying on the uh, security agencies to do that, I don't think it is um, enough. And it will even scare some you know, honest you know, um, uh, you know, voters that will want to come and do that. Because when you see you know, your, the presence of the police, the army, like they have done in Ikiti, with a helicopter. They had a helicopter you know, to go to Ikiti, but there was no helicopter to go to Chibok. So it's a big problem. <laughs> so what did we, what are we proposing? For us, you know, uh, in civil society and in CISLAG in particular, we think it is important in response to the 2015, we should, you know, um, be proactive in terms of uh, early warning, you know, response mechanism. In most times, it is only when it happens, then you see us doing the last minute thing. No proper planning, no proper you know mechanism to ensure that you know you we respond to the issues before they get you know bad. I think also we need to also ensure that uh, we have a network or sub network of civil society for electoral security. I think the election is too important just to leave it to the security agencies, you know, especially when you do not have well, you know, and much of them not you know uh, really trained, you know, thanks to clean that have been consistent on training the security personnel for um, election. I think another you know, uh, intervention which we think will be very, very useful is the democratic you know, oversight of the security through accountability mechanism. All those you know, security you know, uh, agency, I mean agents that were involved in rigging or aiding rigging or intimidating or you know, using you know, security to escort a particular you know, uh, candidate or a particular politician, I think they should be you know, um, responsible for the act they have done because in so doing that, they are also creating a bridge of security. I can't understand why if you are contesting election with other people, then 10 policemen will be following you uh, with arm, with everything. Already are intimidating the opponent. You know? I think that you know, has to stop. Media mainstreaming for effective education, you know, and uh, advocacy reporting. I think it is very, very, you know, important that um, we, you know, um, engage the media for responsible also reporting, you know, because uh, that, like it has been said, you know, it can also, you know, um, lead to some of the, you know, uh, balance that, you know, uh, people are seeing. But more importantly, I think the absence of good governance is the main thing. Virtually every state, whether in the north, whether in the south, there are very few states where you can actually see that government exists. Apart from looting and stealing, outright looting and stealing, you don't see no nothing. And that is why it is a do or die. So if you continue with that, there's no way you can actually guarantee any you know, uh, peaceful election. And even after the election, 
as long as corruption, looting and stealing is the main reason for coming to power, you will you know, disempower the people. Money that is meant for providing you know, water, electricity, education, health, it will be taken. It's only in Nigeria that $20 billion will disappear and the country did not shake and nothing happened and it's okay, it's normal. That is just one sector. It's only in Nigeria that 1.7 trillion will be given as a waiver by just one super minister. And the country need money for water, for electricity, for school. It's, it's, it's too much. I think, you know, we should just be honest enough to see that you know, we contribute you know, towards resolving this problem. I am happy that I am in the national conference and I've seen how the politicians are not ready to allow Nigeria to move forward. And uh, we try, you know, with, little, at, with, uh, with our little presence there, we try to battle them, but it's not easy. But we will continue with the support of like minds of Professor Gambari, who is always encouraging the youth and the civil society they were able to push certain things, but it was not easy. Even at that, you know, it was not easy. So I just want to say that uh, the threat to 2015, there are a lot of issues, there are a lot of factors, and I have not seen that preparation that the government, you know, has made to, you know, guarantee Nigerians and even non-Nigerians that there's going to be, you know, free and fair election. The president has continuously said that, you know, he believe in uh, one man, one vote. But you know, when it comes to action, it is a different thing altogether. It's just like the issue of corruption. You know, I mean, corruption, as far as some of the Nigerian officials are concerned, there's no corruption in Nigeria. And yet, all these billions are disappearing every day. And nobody has been punished. You can imagine the subsidy scandal, the oil subsidy cure with all the people that have stolen that billions, I mean trillion of naira, nobody has gone to jail, and nobody has returned one couple till today, with all the shouting that we are doing. Sometimes I don't even know whether, you know, we should just, uh, we should just surrender. But I think <laughs> the thing is just too much. The amount of money is being stolen in Nigeria on daily basis, if America experienced that, I think your economy will collapse. <laughs> so Nigeria, I don't know, I think it's the magic. The magic, I don't know why it's coming. But honestly speaking, we have a serious problem. There's no need to underpin or to over-exaggerate, but I think we need every support to ensure that the country, you know, survive beyond the election. And that is why, you know, this issue of good governance, productive and positive engagement of our youth should be, you know, at the key center. We don't utilize the potential of Nigerians, especially the youth. We only utilize the, the only utilize the youth potential for negative sin. In other places, youth are utilized for positive sin. But in our own case, it's only for either electoral violence or religious violence or communal violence. Bad things, not really a good. I mean, this is not really good for us as a nation. There's no way we can grow in that manner. So I want to you know, join other speakers to say that, yes, we need every support in Nigeria to ensure that you know, we have peaceful election. I think the whole Boko Haram scene and many other group of militia, because the Boko Haram we are located has been you know, overblown, so something is going to be done or is happening. But I think there are other you know, militia that are also waiting for the 2015 to come and the whole country, they will render the whole country ungovernable. So I think it is important that we all put our hands together to ensure that you know, we have a fair and, you know, um, you know, a fair electoral system that Nigerians can believe in, that when you lose the election, you know you have lost the election. When you won, nobody should change the election. In the previous election, people were declared winners in Abuja. They lost in where the election happened. But in Abuja, Abuja declared them winners, you know. So if we continue with that kind of electoral system, there's no way you can, you know, prevent, you know, uh, possible violence and tension in the country. I thank you.
Thank you very much indeed. Uh, finally, uh, Enemo, let's, uh, let's hear from your perspective. Good afternoon, Hall. Um, this is my second time of coming to the United States to be part of this uh, CSIS engagements. I was here with Professor Jega, and uh, I did share some views then. I will repeat some of them. Um, but the first thing I would like to say is that uh, the south-south of Nigeria is actually known uh, to have had a long history of political violence. Uh, I think everyone here is very much aware of the fact that we've had uh, some conflicts in the Niger Delta region. That's where I'm based. That's where I do my work. Um, some observers are concerned uh, that the revival of militancy in the Niger Delta may become a factor in 2015. I hope not. I don't think so. However, let me mention that uh, from all indications, the core issues that led to the Niger Delta conflict have not been resolved or dealt with. The poverty, the lack of employment, lack of socioeconomic development, and yet to be resolved very, very strong sense of injustice in the region is still palpable. And it is freely expressed. Some ex-militants, it's true, are threatening to unleash violence if Jonathan, President Jonathan was not allowed to contest for a second term. But it is also important to note that the Jonathan presidency is one of the reasons why there is relative peace in the Niger Delta region. Since the declaration of the amnesty program, feelings are still running high, quite high, about how some northern politicians are conniving with Islamic fundamentalists and terrorists to make the country ungovernable for President Jonathan. The Boko Haram insurgency is considered as a deliberate plot by some disgruntled northern politicians to disrupt and destroy his transformation agenda and punish him for daring to contest the 2011 elections and maybe even the 2015 election. And uh, these are strong perceptions that exist in the region amongst the population there. It is also true that there is oil theft, bunkering activities are increasing significantly, leading to a loss of um, over 191 billion naira worth of revenues in the first quarter of 2013 alone. The, the figures vary. The cocktail of increase in oil theft, colossal oil revenues in the hands of some of, you know, individuals with questionable uh, characters, um, the availability of arms in the region, because not all the arms were mopped up during the amnesty program. All this is quite worrying. And of course, in addition, the heavy military presence and active participation, connivance, collusion of the security forces in oil theft and bunkering activities in the region is also a major issue. And of course, as we approach 2015, some people are concerned that uh, such, threats, such threats could get worse. But my point is that we shouldn't worry too much about the elections. Elections will come and go. We, civil society, operating in the region, we are more concerned about the medium term and the long term. The problems of the Niger Delta region could be dealt with. And some of us think that there is a window of opportunity for all sorts of stakeholders to come engage and try to deal with some of the core issues that created that enabling environment for this militancy to flourish. The problems lie there, not the elections. And if we don't deal with these core issues, which I mentioned earlier, then at some point, there will be a resurgence of militancy, of violence in the Niger Delta region. I'm glad that some people are doing some things. We partner with Search for Common Ground in working in the Niger Delta region to resolve some of these problems, changing mindsets. We are also currently partnering with the American State Department, CSO engagement in the Niger Delta region, 
again, to change mindsets, change the narrative from violence to nonviolence approach to resolving some of these problems. Early days, but we are hopeful. We are confident that we'll be able to resolve some of these problems. Um, because today, uh, we are supposed to be talking about strategies to prevent and mitigate violence. I'm going to just go to some bullet points and tick off a few. One, I think we need adequate security, uh, both equipment and personnel to be deployed to the coastal communities in the Niger Delta region. By that, I mean the creeks during elections. Every time we repeat the same thing, it doesn't happen. International observers don't go to the creeks. We can go to the creeks. We want to go to the creeks. So give us the means to go to the creeks to monitor and observe elections in the creeks. A lot of elections in the Niger Delta are won from votes, uh, well, votes from the creeks. So um, you can stay in the urban centers and see everything fine, but uh, when the votes from the creeks come in, everything changes. Happen in Delta, happen in Bayelsa, and will happen again probably. So I think uh, we should watch what is going on in the creeks of the Niger Delta. Um, there should be some sort of mechanism to disband some of the cult groups in the Niger Delta. The Bayelsa State Government somehow grappled with it and seems to have been resolved somehow in Bayelsa. In River State, it's really bad. The presence of these groups in, in River State is already overheating the polity. It is acknowledged that um, some of the politicians or political parties are actually uh, collaborating, partnering with these cult groups, uh, and these cult groups are known to be harmed, so it's a problem. Um, I said this the last time, I repeat it, training of journalists on conflict-sensitive reporting. The manner the media has been reporting is likely to report political conflict as implications for violence. A cost re-examination of newspapers reveals high levels of sensationalism, which if left unmoderated will contribute to violence. Yes, it is true. They should be trained or should be exposed to training on reporting of political conflicts to mitigate risks of their reports becoming triggers for violence. We should educate the politicians. The utterances of some of the politicians to their supporters or against opponents could be considered as a declaration of war. Such individuals that instigate conflict and promote violence must be called to order by their parties or sanctioned by the electoral agencies. Sustained funding by both the federal electoral agencies, international donors, agencies, and NGOs on voters' education. Again, after every election, we repeat the same thing. Voters must be educated. And it must be done in a sustained manner. We are just seven months to the elections, and we want to be right there in the local communities, engaging with them and trying to change mindset. But that's not happening. Oftentimes, funding for some of these electoral activities come some months to the election, and then by then it's too late, you can't do much. Um, I'm not joking, but we should, we should reduce the remuneration for politicians. They earn too much money in Nigeria. Uh, Nigerian politicians earn huge salaries with additional side benefits, which make politics very attractive as a profession. And sometimes, you know, they are sometimes very desperate uh, to win elections by any means necessary. Politics as practiced in Nigeria is about power and self-enrichment and rarely about service to community or society. The ever-widening gap between the politicians and the populace should be bridged by reducing their huge earnings. I don't know if they are going to allow <laughs> that to happen, but uh, some, something should be done about it. Economic empowerment. When Nigerians are economically empowered, they will not deem it necessary to sell their votes for 500 or 1,000 naira. It is poverty that is pushing the average Nigerian to sell their votes. And also, young men who are gainfully employed might not find it interesting to go and die as a political thug for some political party or some politician. So as we grapple with the issues of elections, uh, raising living standards in Nigeria, generally will go a long way in 
reducing violence during elections. Of course, an effective and non-partisan INEC is key for delivering free, fair, and credible elections. They've done well. They are trying. Uh, equity wasn't bad at all. We sent an eight-man team to go and monitor the elections in uh, Ekiti, and the reports we received were quite, quite encouraging. Of course, you cannot compare in the context of uh, a general elections, but we have to give credit where credit is due. The reports were really, really very good about the Ekiti elections. But even that elections are here has been contested in the courts now. Um, the amnesty program, the famous amnesty program, some of us had strong reservations about it, including yours truly, but it's worked so far. Three and a half years of relative peace in the 90 Delta. Um, some people have been given stipends not to make trouble. Others have been sent for training abroad and you know, in all sorts of countries. But there are concerns. Some of these young men have already been trained and they are coming back. Where are the jobs? And there are also concerns that this amnesty program might crawl to an end towards 2015. It would be a mistake. It's working. Find some way to replace it. Uh, look at uh, changing the format. But uh, it is something that has contributed to relative peace in the 90 Delta, so it should not be discarded. Not yet, anyway until we find something, some replacement. Um, finally, I would like to say that the 90 Delta region is at the crossroad. We've had over three years of relative peace in the 90 Delta. Um, and people are hopeful. Yes, there is hope. Some of this hope emanates from the fact that uh, President Jonathan is from the 90 Delta region. But people are also getting disillusioned. People are complaining that uh, how can you have a president from the 90 Delta and the East-West Road, the major federal road in the region, is not uh, completed yet. Uh, people are not really seeing changes in their daily lives. And at some point, this hope will turn into dissolution, will turn into frustration, and then, we should all be worried about the 90 Delta, probably uh, going back to another circle of violence. But as far as I'm concerned, there won't be really serious violence as a result of these 2015 elections. But please, uh, I strongly believe that there's uh, still a window of opportunity. There is relative peace in the 90 Delta. People are coming into the 90 Delta um, I, I know you've been there, and several other people do come to the 90 Delta today. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not the place that people used to say, you know, it's awash with kidnappers and all sorts of criminal activities and all that. And finally, let me say that uh, in a state like Bielsa State, it's more peaceful than even Lagos State. And that message is not getting across to the international community yet. People still see the Niger Delta as a conflict zone um, and uh, it's a no-go area. What the Niger Delta needs today is investment. Investment from the private sector. Change those travel advisory laws and allow people to go and invest in the Niger Delta. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anemo. Thanks all four of you for some great, uh, great comments. Right, we have 20 minutes or so before uh, lunch shows up, so uh, let's uh, open the floor without further ado to questions. Please introduce yourselves and let's have uh, questions rather than statements so we can get as many in as uh, possible. The gentleman over there uh, had his hand up first, so let's start with him. Yes, my name is uh, Andrew Chomomo. I'm an attorney and I practice here in Maryland and uh, my question is uh, the, to the panel, uh, there was no mention of diaspora voters and uh, the overwhelming number of Nigerians outside Nigeria are from the South and Middle Belt and overwhelmingly Christians. Uh, first, 
Not allowing these Nigerians in the diaspora to vote effectively disenfranchises millions of Nigerians. Uh, uh, and then, at the same time, Nigeria relies on the remittance of these diasporans for their foreign exchange, in, uh, amounting to billions of dollars every year. Now, question for you, do you think that allowing Nigerians in the diaspora to vote may counterbalance the propensity for uh, electoral violence in Nigeria because until the diaspora votes, which will be millions, are counted, a winners cannot effectively, effectively be declared? Thank you. Um, let's take a question from this side now. The lady at uh, the front there with the hand. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vivian Anugo. Um, I just completed my master's in international development. Um, well, clearly, security is a threat for the 2015 elections. But I do think that there are about 167 million mobile phones in Nigeria and of course millions of Nigerian diaspora. I'm just wondering, has any individual civil society organization or a group of organizations considered using mobile phone technology to conduct mock elections? That's using as an app or text messaging to conduct surveys. And do you see challenges and opportunities in that? And if indeed you do take it into consideration, would you please include none of the above as an option in the survey? Thank you. Okay, and uh, let's take uh, the other lady just there as well. I wanted to follow up actually on your last point, which was about private sector development. And I think uh, one of the other speakers mentioned the, the tendency for insecurity when you have a lot of unemployed youth or, or people without opportunity or, or investment in the future. Um, so both in the Niger Delta and in some of the, the rest of areas up north, what do you think it would take to really bring about sustainable private sector investment there? Okay, thanks. Well, th those three questions uh, uh, have a certain uh, come together quite nicely. So let's uh, three potential violence instability mitigators, if you will, diaspora, the diaspora, the power of the diaspora, the power of uh, technology, mobile phones, and the power of the private sector. Who, who wants to uh, address those? Let's start with yeah. uh, Raf Sanjay. Yes. Well, I. Th I think there has been, of recent, there has been agitation from the diaspora, you know, to, you know, be allowed to participate in the election in Nigeria. And I think, you know, um, also, uh, I've been one person that I've been also um, personally, you know, also championing that cause. But the problem we had is that until recently, the diaspora themselves, they have never organized themselves in a manner that they can actually advocate and push for that. They only talk in a conference like this. And if you continue to talk here, listen, nobody is gonna to listen to you, you know, over there. So you need to go back to Nigeria or have representative from Nigeria where the thing is happening. Like for example, during the at the national conference, you know, there's a representative, you know, from the diaspora. He has been pushing the thing, but without even proper educating and enlightening of the even even the members to understand the importance of why diaspora should be part of it because the problem we have is that even those who are in Nigeria they are not able to vote. Not to close of people who are there. The ANEC did not have the financial and manpower to conduct any election, you know, um, outside Nigeria. Even within Nigeria, you have not been able to have any serious um, uh, thing happening. So I think, you know, in principle, I personally believe that the diaspora should be given the, you know, uh, opportunity to do that. And, you know, we should actually, you know, um, agitate for that to happen. But I am not seeing that happening immediately. That's part of the resolution that we even have at the national conference. In principle, we agree that the diaspora is such important that they must be really, you know, uh, they are allowed to participate in the electoral process in Nigeria. But it cannot happen with the 2015 election because the INEC and the government has not prepared for that. And like I said, it's only of recent that the diaspora themselves have realized that they have lost, they are not really, you know, there is total disconnect. And I think it is important that they have realized that they need to be connected now. Uh, in the past, most of the, some of the diaspora people would do respect, they, they think that Nigeria, they have left Nigeria and to hell with the people over there. But some of them now are now beginning to realize that it is important that they are actually, they play the role, you know, that they are supposed to play. At least even if it is just to be able to vote somebody that they consider 
uh, useful. So I think there are a lot of challenges that you know, we'll have to contend with, but I think in principle, I totally agree that diaspora people should be you know, um, allowed to participate, and this must be part of the electoral uh, reform process, which in, for now, it is not you know, near there at all, because you are just talking here in America. You need to go back to Nigeria, find allies, and make sure that that is done because it's politics and you have to really make sure that you know, uh, your views are actually you know, uh, the mainstream in that. Otherwise, the politician you know, will not even bother with their vote here because you may not be able to manipulate or you may not be able to do what they want. You know? So it's a big struggle, it's a power, and you don't get power just on the platter of gold. So you have to make sure that you do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who else wants to address some of the, uh, the other two questions about uh, technology, private sector? Uh, Nemo, Chom? Yep. Uh, I will do the ah, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that, that there are some fundamental things that need to change. One is, of course, the general perception that a region like the Niger Delta is still unsafe, prone to violence, and uh, uh, expatriates are kidnapped. You know, it's not happening anymore. It's not been happening for the past three and a half years. So uh, I think that um, uh, some of these uh, accepted notions that the region is prone to violence should change. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the, the, the different countries across the world should encourage uh, that by changing some of their travel advice. Uh, that's one. Number two, I think that the Nigerian state itself, not just the federal uh, government, but also the state governments, should build better infrastructure, basic infrastructure. The electricity, provision of electricity, uh, good roads for you to be able to transport your goods if you go there to set up an industry. and. Um, Nigerians who are quite highly educated, because Nigerians value education, uh, I strongly believe do have the workforce for any uh, investor that would like to go and invest in Nigeria. Um, it is also true that uh, the Nigerian state has uh, put in place some incentives, uh, even tax breaks in some states, and you know, facilities for people to be able to repatriate their profits. So I think it's probably a question of information. If you really are interested in investing in Nigeria, then you should go and get the information from the Nigerian embassy, for example. There are opportunities, and I know personally that, uh, and that was from the amount of the, uh, Minister of uh, Trade and Industry, actually, that uh, a lot of investors are going into Nigeria today because Nigeria, uh, we were told, is today the biggest economy in Africa. <laughs> right? <Okay. laughs> sure. Do you want to talk about yeah. technology? Or... Uh, let me say the, the issue of diaspora. I think that unless uh, INEC is able to conduct free and fair elections consistently. It's difficult for them to add the diaspora. This is very, very important because they are still wumbling and stumbling. And that every time you bring issues of adding responsibility to INEC, people will say, can they cope? So I'm sure that uh, if the diaspora can put more pressure to help INEC to stabilize and to influence the the Electoral Act, that's the only way we can have that. The issue of mock elections, I think that uh, we in Search for Common Ground uh, are planning to do quite a number of innovative activities. Those who are familiar with Search for Common Ground know that we have this global project called the team, which is a fictional football team that uh, raise issues and that we hope to introduce for the elections in Nigeria. And uh, what we, we are going to produce uh, uh, this uh, uh, soap, and then we are going to go to the communities. We are going to use it to spark discussions and to conduct various kinds of activities, including mock elections, 
to be able to really get it to people that this is how the elections are going to take place and this is how uh, citizens should uh, take use the opportunity to make sure that their voices and their vote counts. Uh, this is very, very important because we assume, given the number of elections that have taken place, that people know. But there is so much uncertainty about every election, they change the electoral law. There are few things that remain the same. So people are always thinking that there's a new thing in town. If there's some consistency, it means that we can then additionally enlighten and educate people, bring functional education to them for them to understand what the election means. As of now, they do not see the importance of the elections because the election never changed their life. It never contributes anything to their lives. And that is why they sell the vote because you vote these politicians, they do nothing for you next time they are coming back. So you say, okay, at least let me get something out of it. You know, and, and that is critical unless something is, happens that the communities, the citizens at the community level begin to understand that we are not so hopeless, that we can change, even community by community, begin to change the nature of the elections, begin to say that it will count. For this little community, the election will count, and we are going to make sure that we get a change in policy and in uh, projects and activities that's going to take place here. This is, I think this is one way to move it because the elite for me, uh, you know, they simply have no sense of responsibility at all levels, whether it's government, whether it's political parties, whether it's traditional, there is no sense of what is called responsibility. That if you are required to do something, you should be seen to do it. And therefore change will never come from there. You just watch the campaigns. You will find that no issues are discussed. No promises are met. So if no promises are met, how can they be fulfilled? So we have to generate the issues from, the, from below and make sure that they, they count in the elections. Uh, we're just going to take uh, one more quick round of questions before lunch, so if you could keep your questions very brief and uh, the answers very brief, then we'll get the chance to have our lunch uh, before the next panel. And uh, let, let's start with you, Jibo. The diaspora vote. Uh, the assumption that the diaspora vote is largely Christian, largely Southern, needs to be interrogated. When you add the five million basically Hausa Muslims in the Sudan, and then add another two million in the Zango communities in West Africa, it changes the assumption. <laughs> Professor Gambara, you wanted to, to say something as well. Just a clarification. Um, I was, uh, or oh, I'm still, I'm chairman of the foreign, the national. Conference Committee on Foreign Policy and Diaspora. And actually, we did approve uh, a vote for the diaspora because it's a constitutional right. It's just the mechanics of exercising that right outside. And Jibo is correct. When people think of diaspora, they think it's just the Nigerians in the diaspora in the West. The Nigerians in, the, in Sudan, in West Africa, and some other parts outside of Nigeria are really quite huge in number, and they don't fit into any new categories. And then there are other uh, citizens from other diaspora who have been uh, able to vote. China, the, um, um, I think uh, Egyptians, uh, Indians. The, it's possible to do this if there is a will to, to have it done, you, uh, working with uh, uh, our embassies and consulates all over the world. So in principle, and in, 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 uh, in reality, yes, but still a recommendation by the uh, National Conference. up to, of course, uh, the National Assembly and others to put it in the, into practice. But, but it's, been, it's been done. It's been recommended by the National Conference. But the actuality of it uh, is still waiting for further work. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, you wanted to uh, say something briefly. <laughs> I, I decided I was not going to talk today, just listen. 
despite the fact that Tejibo tried to provoke me, he, he didn't quite succeed. The only thing that I just want to, to respond to him briefly is that it's not true that the government did not immediately react to the Chibo kidnapping. The nature of the challenge dictated the nature of the response. It had to be done, the nature of the challenge was so that it had to be done covertly. And when you do things covertly and you, you are not able to conclude it, you don't rush to the press to see this is what we have been doing. We have not been able to get there. It's only when you get there that you talk about that. That's part of it. But the one that really made me to, to I felt like talking, the issue of the diaspora voting. This government is the one that has, spoke, that has shown so much more, most concern to the diaspora ever. I remember when the, some, uh, the federal government created nine new universities. I was instructed to look for three possible vice chancellors from the diaspora, and the three of them were appointed, including Professor Aluku. They were all from this United States of America. When the, the national conference was going on, they were given instructions that the diaspora should be represented. They, they conducted the elections and selected one of them to be there. And I expect him, him or her, my, there's somebody who called my mother diaspora who is there, him or her to be leading the, the struggle to ensure that the rights of the diaspora are respected. And my good friend, Professor Gambrell, was just telling me that it was proposed. And so we mentioned this thing to uh, Professor Jega several times. And he agreed in principle that the diaspora should be, diaspora should be part of the voting. But we have, to, we have to learn to work before we can run now. We have not really done, the, we are not really perfect at our elections in Nigeria. It takes so much of technology and so much complications to get the votes brought from all over the world and then be counted. We know what happens, what happens here when you get a vote, vote from overseas. It's not an easy exercise. So we really have to learn to work before we can run. Let's get it right at home first. And that's what we tell them. But as a matter of policy and principle, it's been agreed that diasporans should be, will be allowed to vote as soon as possible and feasible. Last one, the, somebody asked about investment in Nigeria. It's all a case of information. Since 2010, Nigeria's volume of trade in the U.S. has grown more than 200%. We are the largest trading partner of the United States. As I'm talking now, there are so many U.S. companies in power, our Greek infrastructures in Nigeria. Even I'm leaving this place to go and meet, to, to go to a meeting with, I'm arranging a, a meeting between two American investors coming to, who are going to Nigeria. So we've got so much of them, and we're very happy in the mission that's happening. All you need to do is to come to us. We give you all the incentives, all the packages. I've got so many, many invitations from many American companies wanting to meet the president when he comes in August. So they're talking about trade. It's not because they haven't come to us. You read that website. All these things are there. The, the packages, the incentives, they're there. So Nigeria is open for investment. We are the largest trading partner for the U.S. in Africa. We are the 29 largest economy in the world and the largest in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Um, I'm afraid, uh, again, time is, uh, is not on our side, and we've, we've run out, and I don't want to, uh, to, to eat too much into your, your lunchtime. So uh, it's 12.45, just past now. Um, uh, there's a buffet lunch uh, outside. Please help yourselves, and if you could reconvene back in here uh, so we can resume again promptly at 1 o'clock. Uh, but I want you all to uh, join me in thanking our, our panelists here for great, great presentations. Thank you.